Hello, we are in Jeremiah chapters 11 to 13 today, and uh, I want to talk about something that happens um, a couple times throughout the prophetic books in both big and small ways, and that's something called sign acts. Sign acts. So like stop sign and the book of acts. <laughs> sign acts, in case you can't understand my accent. Um, sign acts are these sort of dramatic uh, actions that the prophets uh, do or perform uh, to make a certain point. Uh, and we have uh, Jeremiah's first one here in chapter 13, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, but uh, we will see a number of these come up, and they're often really strange and provocative. For example, we actually have already looked at the first one. If you go all the way back to Isaiah chapter 20, God uh, instructs Isaiah to drop his clothes, take off his shoes, and walk around naked for the next three years. Uh, pretty dramatic, right? I mean, that's pretty intense. Uh, and so Isaiah does this. He, he <laughs> drops his buffs and uh, he walks around in the buff. And uh, he, he does this um, to make a point. And what is that point? Well, just like Isaiah had to, um, yeah, had his clothing removed and his shame on display, God said that same thing was going to happen to the people of Israel, that they were going to be stripped naked and their, uh, their shame was going to be visible for everyone. Now imagine having to do that if you were Isaiah. That's, that's really intense. Uh, now, as we come to Jeremiah, we see another example of this. This one is not so strange as that, um, but these sign acts do get stranger. We'll see that especially in the book of Ezekiel. So what happens here? Well, uh, Jeremiah is instructed by God to go uh, to the market, buy himself a belt, and then go uh, a couple days journey to another town and hide it in the dirt in a cave. Uh, and then he leaves it for some period of time. And then uh, God tells him uh, to go and return, to dig that belt up. And he does, and it's all corroded and gross, and it's not useful uh, as a belt anymore. And the thing is, we don't know if, in this case, if uh, anyone else knew about this belt, or, or if this was something that Jeremiah was just to experience for himself. But then uh, we get this point that uh, God says, just like uh, this belt, Israel has become ruined. Uh, the people of uh, Judah, God's people, ha are ruined. They're, they're useless. Uh, and he, he says that, at one time, you were like this brand new belt, n useful. And I actually, uh, I made you so that you would be uh, around me at all times. And you are serving this purpose. You are my people, called to be my people, to, to exercise this, um, yeah, this certain gift. And yet, you are like this belt that someone has just discarded and left in the dirt to rot away and it's been pulled out and now it's barely even a belt. It's barely even holding together. Its structure has been completely compromised. And God says, you, Israel, you, Judah, are just like this belt. It's a really strange thing to do, right? Uh, especially if no one else has seen it, right? We're, we're not told that Jeremiah here had an audience, so we don't know. Uh, so why would, uh, why does God act this way? Why does God use these sign acts to communicate uh, his truth to people? Well, there's a lot of uh, theories about this, but probably the, um, the most prominent one is that these sign acts were like dramatic uh, presentations of, of God's word. So uh, when the people would hear the prophets, they would often not listen. We know that. We saw that a lot in, uh, in both Isaiah's ministry and already uh, in Jeremiah's ministry, that people would have ears, but they wouldn't have, that they really wouldn't hear. They'd have eyes, but they really wouldn't see. Uh, they didn't really pay attention to these prophets and the message that they were communicating. And so 
uh, God instructs these prophets to do these sign acts, which are these um, big, uh, dramatic, uh, and often strange and provocative ways uh, to communicate that same message in a different form. You might think of it today as, uh, as, as we think about teaching in our classroom. And maybe the normal way of, of teaching is like the auditory way, right? A teacher stands in front of the class and says, here's how you do this math problem. Uh, and then explains it out loud in verbal form and then expects kids to understand that message. A lot of that was how I learned growing up and, and maybe you did as well. But now there's been this breakthrough of uh, understanding that every kid uh, learns differently, right? There's, there's certainly the verbal auditory learners, but there's also uh, visual learners who like to see things on a screen or there are uh, people who have touch. They learn by touching things or by manipulating things, by using their hands or their body to be able to understand um, what this is. And so there's all these different uh, avenues that people sort of learn information that isn't just this one of someone speaking at you, but you actually, uh, and so teachers are encouraged to, to use as many of these multi-sensory uh, methods of teaching so that the, no matter who their audience is, no matter how kids learn, they have an opportunity to learn. And so I think of these sign acts just like that that um, when people weren't listening to the words of the prophets, God would have these prophets do something strange and crazy and interesting uh, and dramatic to get people's attention. So it wasn't just a verbal word. It was actually something people can see and hear and experience for themselves. Jesus did this quite often. Uh, we see this in the beginning of his ministry when Jesus turns the water to wine. Now, Jesus doesn't just do this so uh, the party can continue to rage, but it says that Jesus' disciples first put their faith in him after they saw this happen. Why? Well, because they, they knew that this was a sign act. Jesus wasn't just making the party continue to, uh, to rock on, but he was proving something about himself, demonstrating in a visible way that he has this incredible power, power over nature to turn water to wine. But also uh, there's this, this power behind that and what the significance of wine means, especially in a wedding setting, that God is the one who's going to provide um, life and nourishment to his people. And so Jesus does this all the time. Um, by you know multiplying bread or even by cursing a fig tree and uh, the point is so that there are many different ways that God wants to communicate to us so that we get the point point. and this is what Jeremiah is doing here so <laughs> are you getting the point are you understanding um, through all these different things that you are studying and reading through the Old Testament, as you hear narratives, as you hear poetry, as you hear uh, prophecy, as you hear wisdom literature, as now you see these sign acts happening, are you understanding all the ways that God is trying to communicate to you, and are you responding? That's it. We'll see you next week. Bye.